Hey everybody, uh, I've, uh, I'm doing some setup still. I, I'm testing out this new uh, microphone rig that you guys bought me uh, with the Google Hangout stuff. So hopefully the audio will be better. But I don't know how to tell uh, whether it's getting the camera's mic or the mic mic. So I'm uh, going to have Mary check it out for me. And there's a 30 second delay. That's why I'm just standing here talking about nothing. Uh, anything? I, and you can hear me? Okay, cool. All right. You're so you're just displaying your setup. That's how far the delay is. Oh, okay, cool. And uh, it's, uh, but you hear audio? All right. So hopefully this will be the high quality audio from the microphone and not from there. But thank you guys for helping me hit the $200 milestone. Uh, because of that, I was able to get the, uh, here, I'll show you, this little arm mount thing, which I mount to my desk, uh, and then the shock mount, which is the circular thing at the bottom here, uh, I got that as a birthday present, uh, so that was cool. So then I changed the uh, the $300 goal to, instead of buying me that thing, to buy uh, acoustic foam, which I can put behind here and it'll help keep some of the echo from happening when I record. So that'll be fun. So I've got one question today, uh, and unless anyone shows up live or, ha or adds more questions to the QA session, I'll probably just do that one and then be done. Um, so this question is from Aiden Price. Um, in games where the player acquires upgrades in no set order, for instance, the Mega Man series, how do you go about creating balanced abilities and level-specific enemies that work well regardless of the combination? So that's that's an interesting question, and it's it's, uh, it's tough because uh, usually when you're doing something like that, you have the benefit of uh, so like Mega Man, you can go at them in any order, but all of those stages, except for Doctor Wily, because that got unlocked later, all of those stages. Uh, are about roughly equal in difficulty. Uh, the designers may have set them up in such a way that they weren't, like there was maybe a preferred way to go through, but uh, the totally lost what I was gonna say. Awesome, okay, well anyway, uh, if you're making a game like that and you all of the levels are of, of sort of a similar difficulty and not like a, a a game with role-playing elements where you're upgrading your character uh, over a, a, an amount of time so that you want the game to also upgrade over that amount of time. Um, in that case, uh, it becomes a lot harder to, uh, uh, I'm sorry, a lot easier to, uh, man, I'm just not doing one right now. All right. Probably flustered from the setup stuff. All right. So uh, the main part of this question is you're getting the upgrades in no particular order. If you were getting them in a specific order, then the designer would know and be able to plan content for it. Uh, so the, uh, the important thing is to think about, like I was been saying in all these articles, what questions you're trying to ask the player because the answers to those questions are going to be the weapons that you design for them to use, right? And in the case like Ratchet and Clank, where we know that on level one, you, you know, you'll have the bomb and the blaster, but you won't get the rocket launcher until much later. Uh, we can then say, okay, in the level where we offer the rocket launcher, let's start having an enemy that will prompt you to want to use the rocket launcher. So, for example, in, in Ratchet and Clank 1, uh, there are these enemies that are, are like little turrets that throw bombs out randomly in all directions. And those uh, were very difficult to take out at close range, so they would kind of expect you to use a longer range weapon. So it, in, in that kind of way is how, what I mean by the, the enemies asking a question, it's, hey, I'm hard to get to up close, what are you gonna do? And then you provide them with the answer to that. And the way they did that in Mega Man was by making it so that each of the bosses had a weakness to one of the other weapons that you get from the other levels. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think they, they went in sort of a circular pattern, like scissors, paper, rock, around all of the, the bosses that you could beat. 
and uh, so they wouldn't know what you would have when you go into a level but most of the things in that game were uh, weapons that would shoot straight across and so the m most of what they're assuming when they're designing that game is that you only have weapons that are straight across and that uh, times that you'll need to deal with things that are not straight in front of you, say like an enemy up on a ledge, they're assuming you won't have that. And then when you get it, you get to dominate that area and it becomes easier. So it's a sort of a different design philosophy, uh, like where when you're going linear, you want to pace that out over, uh, uh, over the course of your content so that the player feels like they're getting consistently more powerful over time, but not in a way that makes the game too easy. In the case of the nonlinear game, though, you've got to set it up so that uh, enemies in every level ask questions about a set of the, the possible weapons, right? So like in uh, the way we did this in Skylanders, that game proceeds linearly, but we don't know which of the 300 Skylanders that have been released you have now. Uh, so we had to design the whole game assuming that uh, the, the player could have any Skylander of any power level. And once you start making those assumptions about the game, you end up uh, being able to drop certain you know, design truths. Like, for example, uh, the game has to get progressively harder over time or uh, the you know, just just sort of the adages. When you're when you're dealing with something that has such a, a a unique character to it, the whole rest of all all the design decisions from that point are going to knock on, right? So we knew because we couldn't tell what you owned. You know, even the stuff in the starter pack of Skylanders, uh, you we knew what those were, but what if you lost one? Right? So we couldn't ever force you to take one of those and put it on the portal in order to proceed or come up with a, 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 an encounter that was really hard unless you had a specific sort of character. So what we did was we broke them into categories and then designed based on the categories. So we would say uh, there's basically only four-ish categories of uh, Skylander attack, right? And we may, and every Skylander had three of them. So we would make sure that they had at least from two different categories so that if the player has a couple Skylanders, they have a lot of the tools that they'll need. It might not be the exact optimal tool for that exact optimal spot, but they'll have the sort of tools that they need all the time. So in, the, uh, in Skylanders, we had uh, attacks that just shot straight and we had attacks that sort of came over and lobbed. And then we had, uh, characters with melee weapons who will go up and hit you. Uh, and then just guys who are nuts like uh, uh, Wrecking Ball would he'd scrunch into a little ball and go zinging around. And unless you have the toy for that specific character, you don't get to play it, right? So if you don't have the best character for that, that, that section, uh, at least you still have something else. Uh, so going back to that, there's the four categories of those. And then uh, we would say, all right, so we, we know that in general, we're going to be coming across this sort of thing, that sort of thing, and that sort of thing, right? Uh, so we would say in every level, we're going to have a certain number of things that test each one of those things. And not every level would have to test all four, but you'd make sure that, uh, you know, you say you list all your levels out uh, on a chart, you could go down the chart and uh, and just say, okay, I want to make sure that each of those four is represented 20 times in the game. So to do that, I need to represent that in these levels. And you just sort of make sure it's spread out well over the course of the game. And then if that were nonlinear, the main difference there would just be that I wouldn't be escalating the, uh, the difficulty of the enemies the same way. Uh, but the the categories would still hold, right? So you, in Mega Man, uh, you know, you've got just the blaster that's going that way, and you have a few weapons that do that. You, know? it, you have like maybe the Cut Man weapon that does little circles, uh, some weapons that have bigger area of effects, 
and they they basically take those sort of categories and design enemies that test that category. So, uh, you know, like uh, the cut man weapon, in addition to having a, a different attack pattern, also it, uh, it could cut through enemies that were armored and other attacks would bounce off. So it would often be useful in a circumstance where you could take something out if you waited for it to be vulnerable or you could throw, you know, the cut man thing and cut right through their vulnerability. Uh, so the you when you're coming up with the things that your player is going to be able to do, or if you're coming up with the things that they're going to have to fight, you just keep in mind that you're asking. You you need to know very clearly what the categories of questions are that you're asking. How do you deal with someone who's up close? How do you deal with someone who's far away, but there's nothing between you? How do you deal with a case that there is something between you or elevated, right? So uh, you start thinking of different problems you can pose for these weapons, and you start thinking of different tools if you have good problems, if that makes sense. So uh, so basically, I, I, think, I think that's hopefully a coherent answer to that question. But if not, uh, I'll try again. And maybe I can write an article or something on that. Um, also, in terms of uh, uh, updates for Patreon, I'm going to be getting the surprise out uh, to you guys probably today or tomorrow. Uh, also, the uh, uh, I still haven't figured out exactly what I want to do for the for replacing that one extra Q uh, Q and A milestone that we have. But uh, I was thinking that I might do like a Periscope session periodically. Uh, Periscope's a little app where uh, someone can start recording and anyone who's following them, it'll sort of tweet out to them, hey, come watch this thing. And then it's available for a certain amount of time after that and then disappears. Uh, and it's a, it's a phone app. I think there might be a, a web version. I'm not sure about that though. But uh, if you're interested in that, please come to the Patreon chat and let me know uh, so that uh, I can see you know, if anyone even wants to use that. Uh, and if not, I'll try to come up with something else to replace that with uh, that probably won't be Q&A related, but I'll, I'll figure something out. Maybe just another surprise. Um, so, questions. You see? Oh, am I getting questions? Oh, I didn't see. Thanks, Mary. Mm -hmm. Oh, here we go. I see three. Okay, I've got three more questions from Nikhil. Hi, Nikhil. Um, all right. Hey, Mike, I was just reading your article on telegraphing attacks and understanding the use of animations, effects, and sound effects to make the player aware of the impending attack. Doesn't this get a bit gamey, especially in serious games trying for realism? That's actually a good point. Uh, most of the examples I was giving were really gamey uh, examples of telegraphs, and that was mostly because I was trying to overemphasize how it is. But uh, I've worked on games before where I've actually had this discussion with, with other game designers. Um, what you do is you, you you try to look for the principle of what's good about the gamey thing and then come up with an excuse for it so for like uh uh the easiest example i have is uh i one conversation i had was we, we can't really put gaps and ledges in because it makes the architecture look weird so what do you suggest and i was saying oh well you could have a guy stand on a table and even though that's a tiny you know escalation uh, in terms of height, it will change what the player has to do in terms of prioritizing all the other ones. Um, so in the case of, say, telegraphing attacks and animations in a, a realistic game, they do that. Like if you watch, uh, if you look at like uh, Uncharted, right? They're not, uh, uh, they're not being really obvious. You know, there's no big charging, uh, you know, bulb of particles at the end. But the guys will pop up and go, I got them! You know, there'll be some sort of VO to draw attention to them. They'll, they'll have an animation of them. You know, they don't have to be doing that. They could just pop up and shoot, right? But uh, all, that getting ready is to tell you, I'm going to take a shot. And they might even aim for a short time, right? And then take the shot. Um, and the way I usually ask people to implement that when we do it that way is uh, they aim, 
and then they will not change their target. So you, you, you give them, like say there's a half second of aiming, they pick the target before, and then when the half second is done, they shoot at what they picked. So they don't keep updating as they're going, you know, even if they're pointing to, to make it look like they are, they'll miss if you move out of the way. And that's because, you know, the question you're asking with this is, can you get out of the way? Or can you get behind cover, right? It's usually one of those two. Uh, so you, you cheat it a little bit so that if the player under, you know, if the player understands the question you're asking and does the thing you want them to do, that they don't get hit, right? That they, they get rewarded or at least not punished for doing the, you know, the behavior you're trying to incentivize. So I hope that speaks to it a little bit, but I know exactly what you're talking about because whenever I work on realistic games, it's much harder to come up with uh, <laughs> excuses to do this stuff, you know, or 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 validations for it, you know. Like uh, I remember uh, when I was working on Resistance, I needed an elevator in the middle of a circular room, and those don't exist, right? Uh, so I had to I had to just invent this thing out of nowhere, and it, uh, you know, it. Or, or change the whole design to use you know something else that isn't an elevator in the center of a circular room. So uh, a lot of time, what it is is just trying to figure out what the nugget is, what they're what the you know, if you have a best practice, say, and you think, oh, I can't use that here because X. Sometimes you can go into that best practice and just mine out the little bit that you can use, you know. And then figure out a way to cheat. Uh, you know, it's assuming this is the type of game where you can do that. It's not a, 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 you know, like a Dark Souls sort of thing where you want it to be absolutely uh, even and fair in terms of a, an objective sense, right? Uh, if you're not doing that and you can allow yourself to cheat, if it's more cinematic, like something like Uncharted, then definitely do it because. Anytime you can reward the player for doing what you're asking them to do, do it. And anytime you can make it really clear to the player what you're asking them to do, do it. Because then they'll actually be able to play your game. Uh, if they don't, they don't know the rules because you know they, they're, it's not communicated right to them. So any feature that a player doesn't know exists doesn't exist in your game effectively for that player. Um, so. Uh, uh, some games have this problem where the player isn't pointing at the right spot when an important event is. Oh, I see. Okay. Uh, what are some tricks you use to lead the player towards their goal or make them look at something without taking away control? Oh, I like that question. So, what he's asking is like, let's say you're playing a first person shooter, right? And uh, the player can look wherever they want, but you want them to see the way out of the room or you want them to see. Uh, an animation that's happening between two enemies in the distance, or you want them to see a helicopter crash or something, right? Um, the uh, how, what, what kind of tricks do I use to get, to sort of encourage the player to look in the right direction before the, the the thing happens without taking control away? So the best one, my favorite one, uh, this is this is not for first person, but in Ratchet and Clank, uh, one of the things we used to do is when you would grab onto a ledge, we'd swing the camera behind you so that you were looking straight at the ledge so that you could do the ledge traversal. Um, we would then put it, uh, whenever we needed to make a 90 degree turn in the level, uh, we would put one of those ledges. Or whenever we needed to make sure that you were look, that you had the camera pointed in a very specific direction, we'd put one of those ledges so that you would have to jump onto it and the camera would then automatically swing into the right position and the player would see what they needed to see, and we'd put the trigger for that event, you know, on the grab or something like that. Uh, another thing that uh, games really like to do is uh, the long corridor to the room, right? Uh, you put a long corridor without much to do in it, so the player will, at the beginning of the corridor, sort of look around and try to find interesting things to do stuff with or, or bonuses, right? You don't put anything there. So eventually the player says, okay, there's nothing here. And they, they doesn't even look like there's anything here. They walk down the hallway. Now they're looking straight ahead because they've just been moving in one direction for a while, right? So whether it's third person or first person, um, their camera is now almost certainly pointed in a, a certain direction. So you can use tricks like that, uh, tricks of the environment. 
Um, there's also, in Ratchet, we used to use trails of bolts to get people to go and look where we wanted them to. Uh, in, in Skylanders, we put uh, treasure on the ground, and it, it's remarkably effective. Like uh, in Skylanders 1, we were having a trouble, trouble in user testing where we wanted people, there, there was these first two elemental gates, uh, and we wanted to train people on how they worked. But elemental gates are an optional part of that game because you need a, a, a figure of that element to open the gate, and we don't know if you have it, so we can't block your, your progress, and we can't take control away from you and tell you what they are, right? Because it's uh, uh, like to walk you into one of those, you would need to have the character in the first place. So uh, the way we ended up solving it, you know, we tried everything. We tried a cutscene where someone explains it, and they would just walk by. We tried tons of things, and what eventually worked was a trail of treasure that led through the gate. And then when you bumped up against the gate, it said, you need an Earth character to open this. And then they'd say, what? And they'd switch. And because those two gates were the two that we knew you'd have, uh, because we sold the game with them, or we at least hoped you had, right? Uh, the gate opens. You keep following the line of treasure. There's a reward at the end. Now you know about what those gates are for. So uh, uh, there's you know tr tricks of the environment to get the camera in the right way. Uh, there's using rewards to string the player in a specific direction. And then the other one, which is really cool, is using architecture. Uh, in his book, um, The Art of Game Design, A Book of Lenses, Jesse Shaw has an example. He was designing an Aladdin ride uh, for Disneyland. And uh, the players could steer the magic carpet wherever they wanted to go. He wanted them to go in this huge room with lots of columns. He wanted them to go to the Sultan, which was all the way at the back of the room. And 0% of the people would do this because the Sultan was this big on the screen and the room was enormous. It had these huge columns. And so you're on a flying carpet, you go up to the columns, right? And so eventually they thought we're going to have to force them to go and that's going to suck. But they tried one more thing. They just painted a big red line on the floor that went from the entrance of the room to the Sultan. And it just worked, right? Uh, and then they decided, well, we don't want everybody to go to the Sultan. It's a multiplayer game. So we want like one person to go to the Sultan and the other people to go fly around. So they kept that one line and then put two other lines. And then sure enough, one person went down each, you know? So sometimes even really subtle cues in your architecture can tell the player where, where you want them to go without them really knowing that they're doing it because most people are not that conscious about what's pulling them towards something. Uh, Walt Disney uh, used to write a lot about that or, or talk a lot about that in terms of uh, sort of breadcrumbing Disneyland, where he wanted to make sure that from any major spot, you could see another major spot that would kind of pull you to it. Uh, so that's, that's another one. Um, let's see. When, when working on a game, do you test with all control layouts or just pick your personal favorite and hand off the other layouts to some poor tester? Um, if I'm being honest with you, I hand them off to the tester. <laughs> that's an option. Uh, but the, that's actually it, sort of an interesting thing because when you're, uh, there's this, this phenomenon I've noticed in game developers. When you uh, are playing your game a lot, you get too good at it and you don't know how, how good you are. So a lot of game developers will try to handicap themselves by like turning the controller upside down or playing it you know with the bottom fingers instead and just the immense contortions they have to get into in order to play it that way is pretty funny uh so that's what i always think of in terms of uh, uh, uh the, the you know changing the controls as a dev but uh in terms of like if, if i'm in charge of the controls yeah i'm going to play with all of the controls and make sure that they're all tuned right if i'm not in charge of the controls then i will play maybe once through my content with alternate controls just to make sure i didn't do anything impossible and then uh, you know leave the rest of that up to to the people who are in charge of that feature but if it's if i'm in charge of the feature then yeah i'm, I'm playing it with, with everything right so if it's an indie game and i'm doing the whole thing uh, yeah, I'm in, I'm testing the whole game with every control scheme and making sure they're all working right. Uh, so, uh, 
so that's about the end of the time I have. So uh, thanks everybody uh, for having live people here this time. That was cool. And uh, for all your questions. And uh, the next one will be next month. I'll, I'll try to send out a, a notice earlier this time. Uh, people have been asking for that. And then maybe a reminder. Uh, and so I'll get on that. So uh, anyway, if, uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, my Patreon page is at uh, patreon.com slash Mike Dodger Stout. And uh, it's all one word. And uh, if you like what you saw here or any of the other things that you saw, like at chaoticstupid.com, which is where I'm putting all my articles, uh, please come and uh, donate and help make some more. So thanks, everybody. <laughs>